What's up, everybody? My name is Danny Le. I am a librarian at the Santa Clara City Library. Welcome to this wonderful Friday evening on the West Coast, if you're on the West Coast. But if you're anywhere else around the world, thanks for tuning in with us. Um, I am proud to have uh, a new good friend, uh, somebody I've admired for a long time. Uh, I'm going to throw out a little intro in this bio, and uh, then we'll get into the talk. Chef to David Fu is a first generation Vietnamese American creative storyteller from Oakland, California. In 2017, San Francisco Chronicle named him Rising Star Chef. In 2019, he was featured, contested on Bravo's Top Chef season 15 and invited to host ABC's Taste Buds Chef Giving, which was nominated for a James Beard Award. He has worked all across the industry and continues to elevate his version of Vietnamese cuisine. Chef Two builds bridges between communities through his food, as well as the creation of platforms for sustainability and culinary equity. So without further ado, let's give a warm welcome to Chef Two, David Fu. Woo! <laughs> 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 Good vibes, good vibes. Uh, thank you for that, Danny. Um, a very thorough, very practiced, very rehearsed, very professional introduction. I couldn't ask for anything better. Franco Finn, watch out, man. You got a new announcer coming out, man. <laughs> He's coming for you. Bruh, nah, dude. I, I'll, I'll, I'll take a backseat, but if anybody needs a substitute, I'm in the house. I'm in the house. <laughs> So, you know, Chef to uh, just tell us how you're living these days. I mean, despite COVID and everything. I know, and we mentioned before we started, but you just, you know, you recently, you know, have been married, you know, uh, to a wonderful woman. So tell me how everything's going right now for you. You know, like, I, I want to say that I'm good, but, you know, the pandemic has just literally destroyed the food industry. Um, number one. Number two, there's a rise in hate crimes and marginalized communities across the board, specifically Black Lives Matter, um, all the hate that's going against Asian people. Um, I think not too long ago, and it still exists, um, brown people's lives were being exported or not um, disregarded, kids removed from their parents. So black, brown, yellow, kind of everything in between. I feel like that's our community. Um, that's friends that I know here in the community here. This is friends that I know uh, abroad in the United States. These are friends that I know kind of internationally as well too, beyond the United States. So um, when I say that my community, I feel like there's a, a, a human compassion element in myself where it's very difficult for me to say that I'm doing good when somebody asks me if I'm doing okay. Mm -hmm. I have things that I celebrate in my life. Absolutely. Um, my, uh, we're newly married. My wife, love her a lot. Um, I've had some blessings and some projects and whatnot, but I've keep those things as a back seat because I don't think you can really win if your community ain't winning. You know? mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I think you guys may know like Marshawn Lynch, you know, we went to the same high school, good vibes, good friend, all that stuff. Um, and sort of that, uh, our generation, if you will, of, 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 of existing in Oakland, um, you know, we're very conscious of our surroundings and, um, I guess putting our efforts and energies towards that. So, uh, I would say just kind of overall, it's 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 been a fucked up 2020, and it's it's been a rough 21 2021, but it's getting better, hopefully, right? So. Um, I mean, uh, I've spoken with a lot of my friends who work in, you know, especially a lot of creative industries, if not also uh, labor laborious industries, such as you know, cooking and starting small businesses, and it's been a trying times i've seen them close businesses um surprisingly i've also seen some who took an opportunity to open business so um mm -hmm. it definitely left a, a canvas to uh paint the future um not that it's been easy for sure so i definitely echo what uh, you've been saying so but for you to uh you know be celebrated work hard actually you know in the way we see it thrive in the way you do uh, has been very inspirational, and I'm, I'm we're just grateful for that, for your work uh, and strong voice, man. I, I have to say, um, I'm very impressed, and I know you've spoken in, uh, in candidly about this in other interviews, but um, you have such an eloquent way of talking, and you know, it's just it's the strength of your voice, uh, the measured uh, the measuredness of your words that 
really captivates me. Except also your your massive size and how you know handsome you are. And I'm like, dang, look at that guy. I'm like, mom, check this out. Look at this guy. He's so, he's he's not me, but look at him. I, I'm proud of this guy. So tell me more about how that has uh, been a part of your life in terms of building that storytelling component. And I know you mentioned that you done Toastmasters, you know, uh, a nonprofit uh, organization where, you know, does help people develop their own speaking voice. So how has that journey for you as, you know, not just a Vietnamese American, but as somebody people look up to as uh, somebody as a leader in your industry? I think all those things are unintentional, um, you know, whether it's that whatever accolades I may or may not get or how, how people perceive me, I find it's continually humbling for me, um, mainly because uh, like most of my colleagues that are rooted in Oakland, especially those of marginalized communities um, or people of color, um, we found a lot of self-shame in ourselves, you know, in our youths. Um, I came from a food insecure home. My parents are first generation. I mean, I'm first generation Vietnamese American. My parents are refugee immigrants. Um, and you know, like, uh, the story and sort of narrative that I kind of preach and celebrate and claim now, I wasn't celebrating that in my experience. Um, there was a lot of shame. I, there, for me, there wasn't a lot of, um, being celebratory, you know, talking about not having enough food or, you know, um, you know, um, being poor or, you know, living in a crime infested you know, uh, neighborhood or whatever, kind of everything in between. That, that for me was a shame for myself and a lot of my uh, adolescent youth friends. Um, and it was always our intention or our drive to get up out of there. And now it's kind of the opposite. We are claiming our roots, claiming, uh, you know, honestly and genuinely where we come from. Um, and, and it's so surprising to me that people are celebrating and being inspired by these stories that I tell because like I said once again it was very shameful for me um I think a good reference and example would be um we're all taught to code switch especially if you're from the hood mm -hmm. if you want to work at 14 15 years old which we all did they would tell you you know, you need to learn how to speak. You need to tuck your shirt into your pants. You need to learn how to put on a tie. You need to, you need to, you need to on and say, yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. You know, your bosses, you know, were most likely white. And if they were, you need to not look them. You need to like give them a firm handshake and, and be non-threatening. Um, you can't walk around the street with a hoodie on because you'll be associated as a criminal, you know? So there's all these, there's all these prejudices that we kind of, being a person of color from Oakland that we wore on our shoulders, that we were taught that because the way you look, because the place where you come from, you can't be like that. You have to be something else. Mm -hmm. I think that's where that self shame comes from. Um, and um, given that there's that sort of self shame. Um, once again, I'm so, so surprised, but blessed at the same time that people celebrate my truth and my honesty. And I, I feel that um, I, I'm very surprised that even though my narrative is very specific, being Asian American or Southeast Asian and coming from a place of Oakland and just that story of, 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 of not having, um, it really resonates with a lot of people because um, in the 90s and the 80s, even 2000, all the way up to now, the trending media is the elitist. You know, mm -hmm. let's let's use your rapper for example. It's about how many Lamborghinis or Bentleys or Rolls Royces or diamonds. You, have. <laughs> <clears throat> you know, and I, I'm preaching the opposite. You know, we watch shows like House of Ho and Kim Kardashian or the Kardashians because they're rich. You know, like let, let's face, it, I don't watch it, but you know, yeah, everyone else does. Um, so, you know, for to hear you say that, um, and, and to, to, to hear people appreciate this very um, human element, you know, of want and need, um, it, it makes me feel, uh, I don't know, I, I just feel very, so appreciative. 
we just came out with a film called Bloodline. I was a co-executive producer and a host as well. It's airing nationally on PBS. And, um, you know, it, it was a 26 documentary about my family's PTSD um, experience from the war and the way we experience prejudice through food and kind of everything in between. By the way, if you want to watch this film, if you haven't watched it yet, go to chef2.com. Um, I'll type my website in right now. Yeah, tr trust everybody. Uh, <laughs> Bloodline, um, have, uh, watching that 30 minute documentary and seeing the depth of the storytelling that you are, this all, also it's one of your uh, media company, right? You're also a partner in this media company, right? The production of the? Correct, I, I did a full pivot um, from the restaurant space to a chef in the in a media space creating content, whether it's a film, a short film, or um, uh, media content like photos and social media videos and YouTube and everything in between. There's a huge uh, lack of representation in that space. So I, I felt it was my kind of due diligence and duty to pivot to that space. You do it really well. I was, you know, when uh, I read uh, through another interview that you created, I, I thought you didn't have another company come in and film, shoot, edit. It was so refreshing and well done. I, I mean, I hope they <coughs> go through like some film festivals and win some awards because, you know, it really touched my heart. And it goes back to, into, you know, you telling your truth because why I relate and I'm telling, you know, and many other people are telling you uh, why this is so important that you tell your truth is, you know, for myself, I was, I grew up in a very unconventional way of developing my own truth. You know, we're about the same age, you know, I'm in my late thirties as well. And um, I'm tattooed Vietnamese kid <laughs> from Santa Ho, grew up in the the hood and, you know, I, I, I associated through black culture as well. And that was something that um, of course my parents didn't understand, but also through the proxy of hanging with mainly Filipinos, you know? So my story wasn't hanging out with other Vietnamese, which was at the time, you know, a lot of uh, Vietnamese gangs were around, you know? Um, and also the import car culture, which was <laughs> my thing, right? Yeah, but yeah. As, as seeing you and um, as seeing you tell this story, I'm like, and I'm sure there's many out there I, is uh, people are saying, that's my story too. And I've been waiting so long for somebody to uh, reflect that uh, in a in the platform that is like media, you know, and celebrate it. I think I sat with my mother with your documentary and we watched the whole thing. My mom kept nitpicking like, I also sewed. I also was, you know, on that a boat, refugee uh, on a boat. I saw people die. I, X, Y, Z. I, and my mom, I have a garden like that. And that's something that, you know, it's funny, like, what is it about Vietnam, uh, el Vietnamese elders growing uh, mini Vietnamese gardens in their homes, like parts of home spread across every inch of soil? And it, it's amazing because I, I, I see the similarity. I was always thinking about, maybe I should make a zine about that, going to different Vietnamese homes and checking out the garden because it's, it's interesting, but also very much a part of our culture. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I, I'm so glad that you get and feel that, you know, and I'm a big James Baldwin fan and the way James Baldwin is a um, Black American writer, if you will, um, that spent his time in the United States and Paris. And the way that he broke down to white audiences about the Black struggle, and I believe this was during the 60s, right, 50s, 60s, and 70s, that he related to people to remove color and try to see things as a human experience. And he would ask people, like, is it reasonable for people to have these sort of human experiences? And in those eras, people didn't see Black people as human. Mm -hmm. So he took that argument to, to suggest and improve and state that Black people were being dehumanized. Considering that, it's sort of my way of connecting with other people. And I don't think the intention was just to connect with people from my own community, but connect with people um, beyond my own community. And we wanted to illustrate a human experience. Because um, at the end of the day, pain is universal. Mm -hmm. Happiness is universal. 
um, yearning for love, nourishment, comfort, family, friends, community, that's all universal. And um, surprisingly enough, like yourself and like people who look like you, yourself and myself and beyond that, people of other diasporas like Black, Russian, German, Jewish, they've coincidentally stated that they resonated with this sort of space of talking about community and connecting with our mothers and our family and having a garden and sewing and all these human elements that that I feel like it's really missing in the media. Mm -hmm. so, <clears throat> but yeah, absolutely, man. <laughs> um, here, um, here, I will just pivot into talking about, and I'm not, uh, you've already spoken in detail about, you know, your time on Top Shelf. So anybody else can go find those interviews. Um, I mean, I mean, you can ask as well, but like, you know, I just to wrap, you know, just to make it a clean straight uh, slate across the board, everyone gets hyped up with all the, the drama of TV. I just want to say this. I'm from Oakland. I don't play all that shit. No. <laughs> but it was fun. It was fun. They couldn't loop me into it, but it was fun. Yeah. It's, 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 t it's t entertainment and definitely, you know, you got writers and, you know, um, that, that's the thing. You're a real cat. So we ain't trying to play that. However, what I really wanted to say was that um, how was your experience, you know, because you have mentioned how quickly you uh, pivoted uh, and utilized that momentum to build um, other avenues for yourself and partnerships with uh, uh, folks who wanted to work with you. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to know how quickly did that, uh, those uh, kind of connections occur? Was it like right away or were you uh, took the initiative to jump on that? Cause you knew that this is a time to build uh, what I need to do uh, on several different platforms and ends. Slow feet, slow feet don't eat, bro. You know, slow feet don't eat. So I was on a grind and hustle before I even got to Top Shelf. Like I was doing pop-ups. I was doing all these other things to like, just to get my business, just to get uh, my brand, my, uh, my, my, my style of cooking out there because it didn't exist before. And I felt that not that this was ever my intention, but if I wanted to do that, I had to lay brick for myself. And I kind of recognized the same thing that if I got onto the show coming off, I would have to lay brick for myself. Um, I just want to make this point very clear, though. I'm, I'm not about that self-made bullshit. I don't think anybody's ever self-made. I think it's complete eggplant. It's total eggplant to the mouth, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think uh, my drive, my... my you know, the fact that I have a good work ethic absolutely comes from my parents, but in addition, that comes to my community. They, I've had great mentors in my life, uh, teachers, sports coaches, um, safe spaces like Oakland Asian Cultural Center for me to do homework, mm. um, you know, great employers. I'm very lucky to have great employers to pat me on the back and say, you're doing a good job. So all of those things combined, I think, really um, added to the flames that I needed to get to where I need to go in life. And then identifying and recognizing that and kind of um, zoning in on how I exist in the community of friends that I come from, a lot of my friends are dead or if not in jail, you know? Um, and I, it always really bugged me on these friends and if not peers that I existed with, I remember thinking that they were incredibly smart, incredibly charismatic, good people. Um, it's just, they got, they were either wrong, wrong place or wrong time or associated with the wrong people. And I've always questioned myself why just being very transparent on my adolescence and my youth, like, you know, what did I do to not um, go down that path? Because I was right there with them, you know? Um, it could have been me if I went to that party or whatever it was, right? And I think at the end of the day, it goes back to, you know, a, a boss, a mentor, a teacher, um, a uh, 
after school program men mentor e um patting me on the back and telling me i need to go to school or telling me i need to show up on time and telling me that i could do something great i, I really think that was the difference um just to add to as well i think we talked about this before danny is that you know that's why it led me into the community space to work with like inner city youth kids mm -hmm. um oakland chinatown cultural center and all that stuff and um it drove me to do uh, volunteer work in the San Quentin prison, uh, San Quentin penitentiary to work with incarcerated men. You know, so I, I think just to answer your original question of like the doing good and the accolades, whatever, I don't think it's about that. I think every kind of project that I kind of signed on to, either I was trying to do, uh, either I was trying to study something, figure out something, provide uh, you know ask more questions if not that provide an answer to something that i didn't know the answer to or if not those things provide a solution right yeah. um i yeah. think that's one of the best ways you can say about diving in and giving back into your craft is um uh, one of the important things is I, I believe in mentorship i definitely know that i i too um saw my life taking a different trajectory. It could have been in, you know, in very bad places if it wasn't for older individuals or people who saw something of worth in me uh, and brought it out. I was not a very outspoken person as, you know, I was pretty shy, um, but growing up, but it was, uh, you know, my teachers in high school who saw there's an inkling of uh, talent for my writing. And I milked it for what it's worth for the next couple of decades. And it led me, you know, definitely down a great path. But it took people to see that, you know, you're, you're giving your time and your energy and your talent to show um, incarcerated youth or for those who, you know, needed somebody to, um, to confide in. And also to, for the, somebody to tell them that, you know, they can take their lives in a different way if they choose, you know. Um, Good. And I just want to make this clear too. My parents both suffer from PTSD. Like I grew up with my dad nailing the window shut because, you know, he, that's extreme PTSD. Even if you live in the hood, like you should not be nailing your window shut, you know? Mm -hmm. um, loud noises, you know, somebody closed the door too hard, he'll flip out, he'll get very angry. Um, my mom would hide, you know, food in like the most randomest places, like, um, like the bathroom. Mm. Um, you know, I think it's one, it's, it's a very common PTSD thing because like, you know, if you don't know what you're going to get, if you don't know where your next meal is going to be, um, you know, you want to hide it so you can eat it later. And if you've been doing that for a few years, if not decades or a decade, it's really hard to kick that habit, even though that was in her younger years, like 30 years ago, 20 years ago. Isn't that crazy? So considering that, I just want to be very clear with people in terms of my truth and honesty is that um, context is very important. People think that they watch Bloodline and, you know, that I came out of a Disney novel. You know what I mean? Like every time I go home, there's like hummingbirds on each side of my, you know, each side of my shoulders with butterflies and everything's working. It's not the case, you know? Um, my parents struggled a lot and I, I really believe in uh, community in the sort of aspect where it really does take a village to raise a child, you know, because, mm -hmm. and I feel that uh, given the blessing that my parents brought me here into Oakland, Oakland really made me who I am. And um, what makes me really sad now is that I find that um, going into 2000 teens, I see that a lot, there's a lot of funding that's being cut. Mm -hmm. the organizations that I was familiar with in my youth and I, I find that classroom sizes are bigger there's less places after school programs for kids to go to especially owing to the pandemic um, I don't think like kids have safe spaces anymore you know um, and I needed that I needed those safe spaces those nonprofit programs to do homework like my dad is illiterate like he has uh, first grade, maybe second grade level in his native language in terms of um, in terms of reading and speaking and writing, you know? So not to say any, but however, I think he's an incredibly intelligent man. It's just that he was never, he didn't have the privilege to um, understand the value of education and, and the nuances of it. 
-hmm. A good example would be um, having a quiet place for me to do homework or not yelling <laughs> or like, you know, having a TV loud. He just didn't understand those nuances. It's like, just go read a book, go study your homework. Can't you do it? Like it's, it's those nuances that, that, that it, it took me a lifetime, if you will, to kind of like debunk and understand. Uh, but safe spaces are important, you know, um, and kids need that, you know, with, without that, you can't be successful. <laughs> um, I definitely um, echo you uh, and, you know, maybe it's like for you, but I grew up with, as a latchkey kid, you know, my parents were working day and night, you know, um, you know, there will be a pot of rice or something already cooked. <laughs> you guys just got to reheat it. And uh, it's funny because you did mention in a previous interview, you know, you, you ate, you know, sometimes it's just rice and soy sauce. I did that a lot. I grew up like that. Um, and people thought me, I was weird, you know, Vietnamese and non-Vietnamese people. And I'm like, you know, sometimes that's all we had, you know, and my, my mom didn't have time to cook, you know? So you make do with whatever you had in the pantry and also don't open the door to anybody, you know? Can I just, can I just add to that though? Yeah, like yeah, yeah. My, my, my nephews, they live in Laguna Beach and their mom doesn't have time to cook. But you t I tell you this, bro, their pantry is fucking huge. <laughs> but you, you can't you can't discount yourself like that. You know what I mean? Like, uh, you know, there's I think I think hunger is a real thing. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. uh, I think especially in our generation, I think it's, for some reason, the Asian community, a lot of Asian people discount that because they don't want to. Um, it, it's 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 supposedly a sin to reflect any sort of feeling of poverty or mm. that out you know like i i, I mean there's uh, i'm not going to mention any names but you know I, i've known people in my own neighborhoods where you know they couldn't put food on a table but they'll spend their savings trying to buy their children a lexus you know but then the next morning they'll go out and go collect cans just to make ends meet like that's such a sort of poisonous idea of American dream and a simulation. I'm sorry, I'm pivoting the conversation into something. Yeah, no, no, no worries. Yeah, we, we got time. Don't worry, people, folks. We'll get to the, the career aspects um, definitely. But no, it's it's true, you know, and I think it's unique to uh, definitely different demographics and uh, eth ethnic groups that when we talk about uh, food insecurity or how uh, we acquire sustenance. Now, not everybody has that opportunity, but also that pivots the value of what we care about. And uh, what I learned also is in the Vietnamese community, we care about uh, luxury, you know, of standing out, you know, um, of showing that we made it, especially here in America. Yeah. Um, and that, that was always painful because I was never the successful type to my parents, at least doing th anything that moderately makes a substantial amount of money. But, you know, <coughs> I'm, you know we're all flipping uh the narrative for ourselves which is helpful for the next generation um which i'm Absolutely. just you know Absolutely. grateful for um definitely you know talk about maybe you know your perspective because you did work in uh many you know um high-end restaurants uh can you talk about how you seen the business while you were you know going through every level of that industry as well as how it's changed through you know the many pivots because we've seen food trucks uh as for yourself you know you, you've seen the pop-up culture um also you you now have experienced what covid has done to the industry itself um can you talk a little bit about your uh you know what what you personally seen and how your point of view uh will transpire past this period of COVID? Um, specifically in the food industry? Yeah. yeah. Well, well I'll I tell you this, man. I felt like um, for the standards pre Me Too movement, you know, I was a horrible chef, executive chef, or even chef manager, mainly because I always gave people raises. <laughs> <laughs> You're a horrible <laughs> Mainly because I gave people, no, and I'll tell you why. I'm, I'm dead serious too, because I gave people raises and I fired people um, who were abusive. Mm. And um, th there was a lot of um, harassment going on in almost all the restaurants that I worked in. And um, the sort of culture that I come from is that there's the owner where they say like, if that person is doing their job, let them be. 
because they're making us money. We can't afford to lose. That's the sort of grind and poisonous thinking that I think a lot of restaurant owners have. And to be very transparent, um, because when I see the dishwashers, the people who are really working hard in those sort of spaces, um, and this is regarding wages, I, I, I have a soft heart. Mm -hmm. I try to give people wages. Um, and in me doing that and trying to match what I wanted to pay people in terms of how the restaurant financial structure was built, it didn't, it would never work out. And I've struggled with that for years to try to figure out a formula that worked where I felt like it was ethical. And I'm going to call everyone out here. I try to do a fucking buy me pop up for 10 bucks pre pandemic. Right. And everyone was giving me shit. Fuck you. Fuck all y'all. Because you know what? Um, it took the pandemic for people to really see how frail and fragile restaurants are, especially Asian, marginalized, colored, Black, Latino, how frail they really are and the slim margins that they run on. Right. And now, guess what? You go to San Francisco, the cheapest bum me you could get is like 50, 20 bucks. You know, like, I think at the end of the day, we need to understand that the things that, especially the Asian community inherited, no one ever fucking wants to charge you less. I mean, that's a goal so you can win a customer. But specifically Asian restaurants, they were forced to charge less because they came here like in the early 1900s and they were serving to like really race a really racist community they had to discount themselves just to get customers through the door and this was before the chinese immigration community came in you know it's been stuck that way it's so hard and it's it's been stuck that way for so long that you know it's ingrained in people's brains that you know they're not willing to pay more and including second third generation asian american um kids which is really unfortunate but you know, I'm, I'm, I hope and I have faith that um, there's an opportunity for people to learn and listen and really understand um, uh, what's really going on in, in, in these sort of communities, specifically food. Um, but yeah. I mean, we're, you're definitely talking to dismantling the constructs and the paradigms that have been set to work against, you know, BIPOC community, especially in the, in food, you know, whether it's a mom and pops or, uh, you know, a restaurant that's trying to build itself to elevate uh, a traditional cuisine, in, you know, I hate that word, but into their own uh, version of the food in America or wherever they're at, right? But it's, it's, all, it's always tough, because uh, to echo what you just said, whenever anybody talks about uh, a Ben Me coming to be like, seven dollars or more they they in from also some of the same community and it's a it's a sometimes you got to look at it you know from a different perspective they complain like why does this cost this much but when i think about everything that went into that the pate the the ba the bro, meat bro, subway subway a subway sandwich is like six bucks like seriously <laughs> you know what i mean I mean, McDonald's, McDonald's burgers are at least five, six bucks. And that's not even the meal yet, you mm -hmm. know? So like, I, I really think people should check themselves, you know? And, and at the end of the day too, it's also reflective of our legislation, mm -hmm. how are taxed, what, get, what's get, what gets passed on to the consumer and small businesses. I'll tell you this, man, small businesses pay way more taxes than Salesforce or Amazon ever does combined. You know, so that's another thing where it's reflective in consumer pricing. And I think it's really unfair to attack small businesses just trying to make it. Mm -hmm. I think there needs to be a balance between corporations and small businesses. And I think the government can do a better job of doing that, you know? <clears throat> well, if we're going to, you know, survive, because right now um, we definitely are seeing a lot of restaurants trying to rehire their front of end staff, every, right. every position, but... Um, they're having a hard time, you know, and I think it's because due to the that cult, previous culture that wasn't sustainable or yeah. helpful to make a living. Yep. 
and that's that's the thing is that it's just i don't want to think or even put out conspiracy theory vibes where someone's out to like hurt the hurt the food industry or whatever i just really think there's just no representation you know i think i really think there needs to be um a, 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 a secretary of state for food or something like that you know um where there's an expert where they're analyzing all these issues and they can implement them appropriately um because right now i don't i don't know they even know of the issues of struggling small businesses and restaurants they're more worried about like big agriculture farming that gets subsidies from like the from the government you know or they think of it as numbers. They're gonna let, try to give money to the biggest companies because the biggest companies have the most employees and they're trying to like save people's jobs. You know, they, they, everything becomes like a, a budget if not a number, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know? I mean, granted, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm all about, you know, our elected officials and leaders trying to help, but sometimes I think they miss the mark on who they're representing or they don't know you know, they have no connection to who, who they're representing sometimes. And I a think lot of the ones are, who are, you know, they have people uh, in the government, they pay to lobby for them, you know? So, I, I, th I think it's a broken system. You know, like South Africa came out of the apartheid and they fucking rewrote their constitution. I really think we need to rewrite our constitution, like seriously. <laughs> um, we'll get into one of the questions from our uh, audience. Um, Chrissy Lamb says, I took the last six years off to have and raise my miracle baby. I'm just getting back into the kitchen. I've been blessed with the opportunity to do a bit pop-ups. Any words of advice? Um, <laughs> that's a great question. Um, whatever you do in the pop-up space, just make sure it's legal, number one, and then make sure you get insurance. Two main things. Don't do what I did. <laughs> you want to elaborate on that <laughs> um i was doing like underground illegal pop-ups for a hot minute and then it got really hot and then i stopped just right in time before i got in trouble all right i think we all can get uh, what you're saying from there uh right. i mean it's, it's really it's really depending on where you are but i'm pretty sure it's pretty hot all over the board right now because when i was doing it i don't think the health department or any other legal entities knew what a pop-up was you know we were just throwing a party wink wink you know yeah you know it just happens to have you know courses and uh beverages and people you know dressed really nice <laughs> yeah it's all good but i would say those are the two things that i strongly advise anyone who wants to do a pop-up make sure it's legal make sure you get insurance you can't afford to lose period you know yeah, I've worked in streetwear where it's, if you do anything like that, it's just cease and desist, but it's a kind of way of just stop. I don't think in the food world, it's pretty more serious. So I'd say cover your I, faces. I think uh, depending on food journalism now is that if you get, if you are, get some notoriety um, and you get some sort of traffic, um, you don't want bad publicity where you got shut down by the health department and that will only hurt you it will not help you at all you know that's just something uh, i wanted to touch on as well as um and, and it goes due to also you being on uh you know top shelf but when you talk about food industry food media entertainment even uh, uh the critics right how much of that does hurt um you know people trying to start up you know from scratch their business especially when they're a mom and pops, a uh, small business. I, I personally um, hate when I, uh, you know, like platforms like Yelp, too much negative publicity and reviews, you know, unfairly so, uh, you know, give a lot of these immigrant um, uh, restaurants not a chance to, you know, get redeem themselves. Mm -hmm. um, so what are your thoughts? I, yeah. I, I, well, number one, I think, times and traditions and things that you see in the market, they'll always change. You can choose to not participate in uh, programs like Yelp. You know, I've, I've been in situations where I was like, I don't want a Yelp page. I'm not claiming it. You know, <laughs> nobody started it. I'm not claiming it. I'm not participating in it. Um, you can absolutely do that. No one can ever force you to do things that you don't want to do, especially review apps like that. 
Um, but if you do see power in Yelp, which there is absolute power in Yelp, and I think every business that wants to be legitimate, that's thriving, um, opposed to being frowned upon in Yelp and um, disregarding it, I would say learn the system and work the system. It's kind of like, you know, going through school. Everyone's got to get a high school diploma. Just go through it, learn the process. And, you know, in that process, you maybe learn a new, you might learn a new lesson that may be empowering to you. Just know that just because it's like speaking to people, right? I've learned over the years to just let people talk, you know? You may not agree with them, um, but at the same time, you may learn something new. You may learn something about them. You may learn something that you've never heard before. Um, but I think most importantly, you also may learn how not to act because they be make, they might be acting like a jackass and you're like, I don't want to be that person. Right. So I think um, informing yourself, whether you're learning a new craft or learning something that you dislike, um, which happens a lot in business, is a very, very powerful thing. Um, and I don't want to demonize uh, Yelp. Um, there are ways for you to um, uh, utilize it as a tool opposed to something that's a thorn in your side, you know? Um, and I think uh, you're always going to get a bad review. Uh, I think as long as you can read between the lines and um, see through the static, if you're getting consistently um, feedback that your service is too slow, no matter if they say it nicely or they, no matter they give you a good review or horrible review, but if that's consistent across the board, you know, for six months or so, that's, you're, you know, if you know how to look at Yelp in that sort of way, Yelp's a tool for you to gauge your performance, you know? That's, a, that's a probably one of the first positive spins on Yelp I've ever heard, but um, I think that's a good way of, for anybody who's ambitious to start something is look. Can, can, can I just say this? Can I just add this as well, too? I find that um, I think if you're, if, if you're a food, foodpreneur or a chef or someone who's aspiring to be in the food business, who gives a fuck what anybody thinks? Fuck reviews. But it's super important to listen to those and you can pick and choose what you feel is honest and what's not to gauge yourself. I think feedback is the most difficult thing for a person, period. Mm. It's so hard to sit there and listen. I don't think anybody's perfect at it. And for somebody to tell you point blank how you're not doing well, right? But if as an entrepreneur, if you can sit there and listen to it and digest it and, and try to find it you know, empowering, um, and learning how to decode what people are saying to you, fuck it. Like, who gives a fuck? You know, you're doing what you want to do. You're you're cooking food, and as long as that you're taking the information back to realign your vision of what you want to do in life. I mean, use me for example on Top Chef. I really gave a shit about what anybody said about. I do what I do, you know, and I know what I can do best. You don't ever need somebody else to tell you if you're good enough or if this was great, you know, if you're doing what you do and you have enough people come through the doors and you see growth, that's all you need to worry about. It goes back to the joy, what you, you, you know, you're trying to um, show the world and not so much what others have, you know, kind of view you, you know, their perspective of you or anything. So um, I think that's, you know, it's a very uh, noble thing to just leave it on. Um, think, uh, we're going to wrap up with, you know, what, where can people find your food? I mean, I've, uh, I've noticed that, you know, you're, you're programming more sh tele uh, shows or uh, content on your YouTube channel, as well as uh, you, you know, you're representing a couple uh, food companies. So tell us what, uh, what's up in your uh, alley these days. Oh, uh, check me out. I'm going to be on Good Morning America, May 21st. Hey. Yeah. Is it May 21st? I'm sorry. May 18th, Tuesday morning. Yeah, May 18th. So I think that's next week. Yeah, next uh, Tuesday, I think. Yeah. Yeah, check me out. I'm going to be on Good Morning America for AAPI month. So good vibes there. Um, I can't say too much further than that, but just make sure you tune in if you can. Um, as well, I have a AAPI charity dinner on May 21st, speaking about food. And I, this is my first dinner in like one and a half years. And um, I'm collaborating with the 
Asian Hustle Network dudes, a group, if you will. And together, all the proceeds are going towards charity uh, to help the Asian community out during these like really, really difficult times. Seven course tasting menu. Um, if you guys go to my website and subscribe to the newsletter, you get you will get a newsletter on how to sign up. So, um, or it's going to be on Instagram by tomorrow. So either or. That's great. I'm uh, I ha I'm talking with the Asian Hustle Network later this month. Good folks, um, and I love that you're pivoting into how uh, helping community and supporting community through your food. Um, just before we end, um, maybe just some you know shout outs or call to actions that we need to do, especially during this time that, you know, things are not back to normal, you know, um, especially for folks who are trying to create a livelihood through this uh, pathway in the culinary arts, as well as if they have a passion to just cook for others and do that. Um, maybe some things that you've learned along the way or you, you wish to see more into the industry or in the community at least. Um, I think this is an easy call to action for everyone to do. Stop ordering a DoorDash and Uber, you know, just get in your car and go pick it up. Mm -hmm. When you do that, those, those, those entities, if you will, they, they take a huge chunk out of the restaurants and you're not supporting a restaurant by ordering through mm -hmm. DoorDash. They are on DoorDash because they're separate. I mean, because they're desperate, number one. Number two, for entities, uh, that are large, you have to be a fairly large entity to be able to benefit from selling from DoorDash. You know, but, you know, if you want to smart support your, uh, uh, if you want to support a small local business, specifically in Asian food, just go and pick it up, call an order and pick it up. I think that's an easy action item for everyone to do. Um, what's another thing? Um, um, support local, um, buy in stores, buy from your neighborhood. I, I think those are the most powerful thing. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Uh, donate wherever you can. I think donations are more powerful than ever. There's a lot of uh, nonprofit organizations that were rocked because of 2020. So, um, but yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, I'm I'm right now in in Oahu, like eating, you know, a distant <laughs> distantly from people, uh, or not at all having to take it out. My favorite joints. It's not the it's not the business. However, I do get a view of the beach, but um, I miss the, the camaraderie through food, you know, uh, and laughter uh, through food and drink. But I also, uh, in my, the industries I used to be part of, I miss dancing clubs, <laughs> <laughs> close to people. Yeah. Um, but I know that, you know, it'll be taking time. And through that work, as your call to action says, we all got to help each other get it right. Things are, were out of whack before. Um, and now we just got to realign things and look at it uh, holistically and fix it. So um, I'm grateful I always go pick up my food from small businesses, you know, because I want to see their faces, you know, behind a mask. It's all good, but they got to know that I'm about their Ethiopian food, which I tend to get. <laughs> um, you know, David, uh, I mean, too, um, I'm just I'm just grateful for that, that you exist. Um, I do hope to be able to see you soon. I know everybody uh, who's joining us today has uh, got the real um, energy that you profess through the screen. Um, and I know you're a, a real cat too. I'm like, that's the people I mess with. You know, they, you know, if they're not going to mince words. They're going to tell me straight up, uh, depending on if people want to hear it or not. Um, but that shows that uh, you have something to fight for. And I'm just grateful to call you an ally, uh, hopefully a best friend in, in the future, but I do hope to do this in person. So uh, good vibes, man. I'm I'm a big fan of your work, and you know I think the the fact that just just for the record that what you represent, you're breaking all the stereotypes of what a colored man, a Asian American man, um, a man from you know sort of our back when I narrative is supposed to represent. Like you're you're not supposed to be rocking tattoos, a t-shirt, and beanie. Like a, a librarian, if you will, should be like you know geeky and. Like, <laughs> Urkel, Urkel socks and all that stuff. And I, and I love that I beg you because when kids go into a library or they, they hear that you're a librarian, they're like, wow, librarians could be dope. And then that unfolds like how amazing a library could be. You've heard me say that the library is one of the greatest American institutions alive, right? I mean, around, right? Mainly because, you know, all walks of life, they're homeless people, people who need to use a computer, 
you know, where else can you get free information, right? Like, um, and we're fighting for it, just like how you fight in your industry. Um, and you, as you spoke about equitable spaces for the youth, yeah. um, we're asked, libraries are asked to do more and more all the time, uh, sometimes outside of our job description, but uh, we care, we care so much because we already know where things are getting cut. So if we're, if we were one of the last bastions for information, self-education and safety, yeah. so be it. Uh, but definitely it takes many people in the village, the city, the community, the world to support what we do. Um, just like you in the, the, in the food industry. So um, people out there, you gotta support what you love. Uh, because if, we, if I do more events like this with the rest of the librarians who believe in these talks, um, we need you to vocalize that. As well as you, if you love the restaurants you love and the people who cook it, get in their spots, buy direct and tip. Please take care of uh, people who uh, serve you. you know? Absolutely. How do we support libraries? I'm just curious, like considering the pandemic libraries been closed and I don't, I don't know how um, to. Yeah, so um, though, uh, though we've been closed, libraries have, uh, and librarians and staff have been supporting the community through still loaning out materials, still on the phone serving those who don't have um, internet, who are, you know, not, uh, you know, have the luxury of, uh, be, have co computer, we still do many things that we can support. The best thing you uh, individuals in the community can do to support libraries, talk to your local leaders, let them know, because uh, not to say things, but money is always a factor, especially if you're uh, tax funded, you know, like anything. And yeah. people can get, get taxed on other things, money's tight, but you got to show that you the library is something that uh, supports your community. And a lot of times, if you don't use a library, do you find, you know, find that the value in it, in that for others, if you don't use it, mm -hmm. it's necessary for it to exist. So be vocal. And I think it's anything we are trying to teach, right? And tell people, you gotta be loud and vocal. There's no point in being silent. Absolutely. And, you know, pre-COVID, pre I would go to the library because it was like a comfortable, fast, uh, internet speed, Wi-Fi friendly, comfortable chairs, quiet place for me to do my work. You know what I mean? And I was just have my hoodie on. This is post top chef too. Have my hoodie on. You know, that's why I finagled my way in the library to the library. I, I cheated my way in. I'm like, hell yeah. I'm <laughs> now. <laughs> they should never let me in. <laughs> My brother, um, we'll talk soon. Uh, and everybody, please be safe. Uh, if you can get your vaccine, if you choose to, I mean, do your research, but um, in order for us to move forward, just, uh, you know, we all gotta be able to do our part. Um, definitely be, be well, have a great weekend, and we both will catch you in the next time. Peace.